it's game on. Town come from behind to beat AFC Bournemouth 2-1 at Kenworth Road on Saturday afternoon. Do not say a word until you can have your moment in a minute. Just four goals now separate Forest and Luton Town uh, either side of the bottom three. A rather smug Lutonian journalist James Cunliffe is with me to uh, recap all of the action. Jimbo, game on, my friend. It's happening, isn't it? Bloody happening. It is absolutely happening. We will reflect on a quite magical afternoon at Kenilworth Road after this intro. Hello everyone, welcome along to another episode of the Luton Town Supporters Trust podcast. As I said before the intro, I've got the Lutonian journalist James Cunliffe alongside me. Uh, but before we get stuck into the game, uh, I'd like to report a missing person, James. Um, goes by the name of Dominic Solanke, last seen coming out of a tunnel at Kenworth Road around about 2.57pm Saturday afternoon. Reports he was in a pocket of a Luton defender, never to be seen again. Yeah, well, somebody wants to get round to Reese Burke's house because when he emptied them, I bet they bet he turned up. He absolutely did. Yes, uh, what an afternoon of association football that was. Oh, it's what you live for, isn't it? What oh, such so good. I've just been to put some pep in your step, and it? Uh, it makes. I love doing these. Don't get me wrong, but when you've been beaten but played well, it's 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 sometimes a bit hard to get up for it. But um, I wanted to do this the minute that <laughs> Carlton Murray scored that goal. Uh, and certainly when the bloody final whistle went. Yeah, we waited a little bit longer than we normally would do for the Knott's Forest game to finish because obviously that result impacts how we're going to talk and everything like that. But I would just wish we'd have just recorded normal time, you know. We're absolutely buzzing. And to be fair to yourself, you called it. Come on. <laughs> oh, top of the prediction league. How's about that? With... <laughs> with Two correct scores. We really are shit at this, aren't we? Listen, our prediction league has mirrored Luton Town's first Premier League season, which is results hard to come by, but the quality is always there. Uh, but what we're seeing now is um, a prediction, a predictor who's fighting to the end, and uh, he's got a couple of gammy legs, but he's giving it. He's all heart and passion to count them two, two predictions right top of the league he certainly does fit the loot and mold of injured injuries there uh, that much is for sure I should also a shout out to claire clark who also called 2-1 uh, go on claire she would have given us the scorers had i have asked i'm absolutely certain of that so i think she's got one up on uh, one up on you mate yeah, i actually think i think i'm right in saying i sat behind claire at the away first away bournemouth game so uh there's a little bit of um symmetry to it all where do we start? Well, we start at the beginning, I suppose, don't we? Team sheet. We said in the preview we'd would love to have Reese Burke back. We knew we were going to have Reese Burke back. He didn't name him, did he, in the pre-match? But he gave every single hint and clue that the one player that he was going to have back was Reese Burke. Reese Burke came in for Fred on your dimmer, and then there was the ch- the other change that we mentioned in the preview, Chong for Pelly. The team just looked nicely balanced didn't it actually how she finally got to play in the position that he thought he was signing for us in <laughs> a right wing back and actually the structure of that back five um james played a huge role in this game because it was Issa who was left center back uh then reese burke then uh, mengi sorry Issa who was right center back then reese, uh, reese burke and then mengi going from right to left and the reason why that was key was because we had semenyo covered and in the first, so in the second game, we'll call it second game, we couldn't cover that boy at all. He was not a factor whatsoever in this game. And that was huge because obviously he'd set out the Crystal Palace game, hadn't he, for them in midweek. So we knew that he was going to start the game. So for Hashi and Issa to keep him quiet went a long way to deciding the overall outcome, really. Yeah, I thought the defence were absolutely immense, really. Um, yeah, it's, it's right to highlight Burke and the job he did in Solanke, absolutely. But I thought 
Uh, Issa Kabori was outstanding, particularly in the first 60 minutes. And Ted and Menke as well. What an absolute warrior that guy is. Um, yeah, he's a, he's a future captain for hopefully Luton, maybe somebody else. He's, he's an absolute star, that guy. Yeah, we've kind of called Ted Menge right from his debut at Exeter. We knew that there was a star in the making, but I don't think we knew quite how much of a star there was in them. I mean, this bloke, he's like the bionic man, isn't he? Twice they killed him and he just got up again and he was like the Undertaker at WrestleMania, wasn't he? He just up he gets and cracks on again. It was it was incredible. Twice I thought he was going off. They actually had Fred prepared, didn't they, the first yeah. time around to bring him on and Ted's like, no, no, no. I ain't coming off this football pitch until that final whistle blows. And, I mean, what a performance. He was absolutely everywhere. He is superb. I mean, I watched the Man United-Liverpool game earlier. And you're like, <laughs> he walks into that side, absolutely walks into that Man United side. So the recruitment team have pulled their pants well and truly down. Yeah, and somehow Ted and Mengi is able to warp time and space when he gets injured as well because he only his two injuries only cost three minutes at the end uh, of the first half, which is pretty bizarre. But, yeah, I thought he was a gunner. Um, and they showed some... I don't know if they showed it on Match of the Day, but at the time on the, the screens in the press benches, they showed the live clips of what was going on while he was getting treated and Rob Edwards looked pretty concerned and I thought, oh, no, this is bad. And then Uppy Pups, I think your analogy is is pretty spot on. Him and, him and Tyson Fury is uh, exactly what that was. I thought he was dead and buried. He's got a knee problem, I think, but he says he's going to play on um, as long as he can and, and, and help the team. So uh, much needed because he was outstanding, really, the, the, the lot of them. And um, you, you could say that Bournemouth had the best chance in the first half. And that's fine. But they were all long range. But they were very good long range efforts, uh, but they weren't cutting through Luton at all, which is testament to how they were playing. But um, also, it sort of suggests that you can't say you weren't warned when the actual goal did come. No, you can't. Um, Signal as it was. The other thing that we sort of highlighted in that um, preview was how susceptible they are to crosses. And obviously we saw that right at the end. But we saw why right at the start, didn't we? The most innocuous cross you've ever seen in your life. And all of a sudden, the goalkeeper, with no other person in the penalty box at all, decides to punch it with two fists. I'm like, we're going to have some fun and games with this boy today. And uh, it took us long enough to make the most of it. But it we did was causing do. me yard palpitations in the second half when he kept saving stuff, well, considering he did that in the first half. So, um, yeah, thankfully he didn't get near the... <laughs> the two that mattered. Yeah, if ever there's a goalkeeper that's got white line fever, uh, he's he's your man. You're right, long shots were raining in on goal, weren't they? The first one from Tavernier, um, I was like, bearing in mind I'm in the kennel offence, so it's at the other end. I'm like, he ain't shooting from there, is he? And then Kaminsky put a three-man wall up. I'm like, well, maybe he is. But I was like, in no, in no way he's beating Kaminsky from there, but he nearly bloody did. Caught the corner of the post and the crossbar, and it shot out for a throw-in. And, uh, yeah, like you say, warning signs uh, immediately triggered there. It's a cracking effort, to be fair. It was. I guess that's the quality, isn't it? I mean, you know, everybody talks about Bournemouth being a not very big t- club and stuff, and they you point to the, the ground, which is now officially the smallest ground in the Premier League this season. Um, and that's why they think that. But Bournemouth had close to £500 million spent on them. And when they went up the first time uh, from the championship, they were bankrolled by, I think, a Russian billionaire at the time. I think he's not involved now, but they've got a lot of money behind them, Bournemouth. So it's not it's not quite the same. They're not level pegging these two teams. You've got Dominic Solanke, who, yeah, Rhys Burke kept absolutely quiet, but he cost something in the region of £30 million. Uh, he, and he wasn't putting up trees from, from Liverpool when he went, and he hasn't pulled up trees until this season as a as a Bournemouth player. Um so that's the sort of money that they've got available to them. And it's um yeah, it it's it's still very much a David and Goliath scenario when you put the two elevens against each other. I mean you have to say in the four hours of football we played against this lot, apart from the two goals he scored, he's been largely anonymous, hasn't he, Solanke? You kinda of wonder what he's doing against um, all the other teams. But long range shots kept on coming this time it was Cliver who hit the same post outside of it thankfully and um, away it went and then another one went fizzing over our crossbar as well in a kind of frantic sort of 
10 minutes really I thought we started the game really really well but then we just panicked once that free kick hit the hit the post and crossbar we just could not get any composure poor old clicker every pass he was making was going straight to the nearest bloke <laughs> to him and uh, we were turning the ball over in dangerous areas we kept on turning it over to Christie who's a pain in the ass with with his creativity um but the good thing was we protected the goal pretty well. And the closest they came to actual scoring in terms of hitting the target was once again from our own man, Hashi. We're orange. Kick the other way from Kaminsky. We're all good. Um, but that was it. I mean, to be fair, the ball's just hit Hashi, hasn't it? And thankfully it's looped up and TK's managed to get a mitt on it and get it away. But even that sort of highlighted the panic that we got ourselves into in that first half. It, we were nervy. Of course, we were nervy. Everyone knew the situation of the game. By all accounts, the boys got themselves together in the lead up to the game and kind of thrashed out just how big the game was sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. And and it showed. But, you know, in recent times, we've killed ourselves. We shot ourselves in the foot. Certainly the last two games, two own goals. This time we didn't and we got to half time nil nil and you just felt that that was huge, really. I mean, little did we know that the, that the wind was playing such a huge role in the game or or maybe that was only Iriola's um thinking but to get to half time nil nil was big it, it was at that stage yeah definitely because well we've talked many times about conceding goals at really bad times and to concede just before half time would have been a bit of a killer uh, i mean i thought for a long while actually when they scored straight after the second half that that seemed like it was going to be a killer not because Luton weren't playing well and stuff like that but uh, we'll get to that in a minute but um yeah, the um, the wind scenario. I, I'm I must I wasn't in the press conference with Iriola. I'm pretty sure that must be sort of a, a lost in translation thing because when you read it on the page, when he's talking about, he didn't realise the wind was a factor. I'm sure that's not probably what he meant to his Spanish mind. And then when he was translating it to English, it probably came out. Yeah, on <laughs> on match of the day, he said they had the wind in their favour in the first half and didn't make enough of it, and they knew at half time that we would have it in our favour. I could have sworn the wind was blowing into the kennel of end, though. So I don't know where he's coming from with um, with that. I was taking a full face of wind in the bobber's gantry anyway. So um, it was it was it was giving it some around the whole ground and making for you know, lively conditions. It's kind of weird, though, wasn't it? Because I think it's the first game this season. Correct me if I'm wrong, people out there, but I think it's the first game this season we've shot at the kennel of end in the first half. You don't see it very often, do you? That um, coin toss thing and changing ends. It, used to be a massive thing when I was playing foot park football admittedly and I was like make sure you like pick the pick the terrible end to shoot in first until you've got a better run at the second half that sort of thing and you don't seem to see it much in professional football but um yeah I, it, it worked <laughs> maybe that's what we need to do all the time absolutely yeah I mean in terms of our own chances in that first half, Chong blazed the shot over from the edge of the box, which... I thought it was a really good chance, to be honest. I mean, turned fantastically well and maybe he was on leaning back when he hit it. But, at, you know, at that stage when it was nervy, if he'd got that on target, it would have been a great goal for starters, but it would have settled everything but um, settled everything down, sorry. Uh, yeah, it was, it was a really good chance and he played well again, didn't he, Chong? Yeah, he did. Brilliant work from Townsend uh, in the lead up to that, who also had a really good first half. Kind of ran out of steam a little bit uh, after half time, but, you know, three games in a week, I don't suppose he's done that well for a long, long time, actually, to be fair. It's about two Andrew. years, probably. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that's the kind of levels that these boys are putting in and putting themselves on the line. So we did get to half time, and obviously Rob's um, changed one or two things, not necessarily tactically, but just reasserted the fact that we want to be on the front foot and play with the play the way that we do and immediately we are on the front foot Ross Barkley burgles Kelly possibly to get the ball flicks it into Morris Morris finds just half a yard it's an un, a brilliant shot from the kennel end I'm absolutely convinced it's in and out of nowhere Mr White Line Fever's got down and <laughs> pushed it round the post I mean if you'd said to me when he made that punch in the first half that he was capable of making saves like that I'd have been like yeah not sure but this is our luck at the minute isn't it and pushes it round the post and within what two minutes they've gone down the other end and 25 yarder he's just hit it straight away no fault of Kaminsky at all the, there's no back lift on that shot whatsoever he's just hit it as soon as it's come out to him Kaminsky can't even get himself set even if he knew it was coming and 
it's just fizzed in the bottom corner and you're like, how is your Donald? We've absolutely come out of here, all guns blazing, and now we're behind. The first time in the game we've really built up head of steam, the crowd are going. We wanted the crowd, Rob called for the crowd. The crowd were really good. Could feel it in the warm up that the crowd were no not Sunderland and Watford. We need to stop thinking that we're going to be Sunderland and Watford until deep, deep, deep into the season. But we were certainly up on recent times. Uh, and then that goal is just like oh, for the love of God. Yeah, absolutely. I, I have to say that I, I was a bit doubtful whether the crowd would be like that. Obviously, in the last podcast, not because I. Uh, have a lack of faith in them but it's just, it's just the scenario that we're in but full credit to the the whole stadium they were well up for that and um, it did contribute to a fantastic afternoon um but yeah the goal was a signal a real signal because i was behind that morris shot and i thought that that was in all day long hit it clean um perfect and then you no know, gets down to it and at that stage obviously we're all football superstitious at least and we're like that's not gonna happen is it at least this is still not gonna happen and compounded by the fact that they go down the other end and score that because it how many times um you know we you credit to the fence they don't create chances by going through you how many times and this is the ruthlessness of the division where they get just a half a yard or something and their accuracy of shooting is incredible you think back to the chelsea one and the madueki goal i didn't even know how he got that in. i didn't even think he had a like right to shoot from where he was and yeah it's it's a sickener um but thankfully, you know, the crowd was, was done for a little bit, but got got it back up. And I think helped by, you know, Ross Barkley really uh, building up ahead of steam himself, trying, almost trying to win it and get back on it and on terms himself. I mean, he had a couple of shots, but though they weren't troubling the keeper, it it gets everybody back up and thinking, no, there's, there's still something in this, isn't it? Yeah, he was in a shooting range, wasn't he, yeah. the boy? Every, every time he was 25 yards from goal, it was ping and... One sailed well over a couple of sort of daisy cutters that uh, the goalkeeper got. But yeah, the most important thing was Ross was on the front foot. We, he was kind of subdued in that first half, not because they were doing a job on him, but we just couldn't get him into the parts of the pitch where we wanted to get him into. And Well, also passes weren't going where we needed to. I mean, I mean you know, on any other day, perhaps, if the injury crisis wasn't so bad, you know, Clicker wasn't having a great day, he probably might, maybe he comes off at half time because it... it, it it's about time the injuries did something good for us, wasn't it? I mean, he was, he was trying to do the right thing and play through the lines and be positive, but every pass was getting cut out or blocked or something like that, and then it put them back where they wanted to be, which was countering, because that's what they were so successful at in that first half and up to the goal as well, obviously. Um, and so any other day, maybe he comes off for somebody, but there's no other options uh, as a, in a creative sense, and thank God, because after that, he he turned up. Yeah, the big difference with Clicker in the um, second half was rather than passing it, because like you say, his passing boots weren't with him, he drove with the ball. And that's what we were so successful at down there. When we got the ball in the heart of the midfield, we drove beyond their midfield. And then all of a sudden, your Chios who played in that game, your Chongs, your Alfies, your Issas, they're all in the game. And that was um, very reminiscent here. I mean, one of his sort of driving runs led to... Carlton Morris getting the ball in the inside right channel as uh, sort of former position uh, was known. He cuts inside, unleashes another shot that's in for all money. And then all of a sudden you get Jason Walker vibes of, um, well, we'll mention that probably in the next podcast, I suspect, but <laughs> it hits the post and comes out. It takes a lot to deflate me and make me doubt these boys and, or not these boys, but this club. And when that come out, and then the the re uh, it fell to clicker, didn't it? And that yeah, was blocked. blocked. And I'm like, these boys are giving everything they can. Will someone just give them a bit of luck? This is not going to be our day again. Back in the eighties, you wouldn't have known that Everton are winning, but of course, in the modern world, we all know that Everton are winning, and that's making everyone more and more anxious in the in the crowd. And oh, poor old Carlton Morris. See, I thought he's absolutely brilliant yesterday. And I'll talk about him a lot more once we've sort of covered the game, but he could not have done any better with that chance. He's curled it beautifully round the defender. He's even curled it round Fred, who's got himself right into the um, mix at this point. And he's just hit the post and come out, and you're like, please, someone give us some luck. Yeah, it was. Uh, it did feel like that. It did feel like it, just nothing was going to go for Luton on the, on the day. Um, until, you know, it was until Clark scored the goal. Luton had played really well, but weren't getting what they deserved. I mean, how many times we've been there this season? You're thinking that's no, it's no good. And I was 
I, I was starting to think this is not going to happen. And, you know, re relegation was, it was right there, right in your face, wasn't it, all of a sudden. Then, but we should know better, <laughs> shouldn't we? Then a bunch of um, League Two players come on and turn it on. We should know better. I don't, I don't say that with any disrespect. No, no, absolutely I not. say that with absolute joy that that's, that's the case. Yeah, well, it's, it's just... If ever there was a 20 minutes of Luton Town, mm. it was that really, wasn't it? Uh, the substitution, of course, Fred's come on and uh, Fred's come on for Chong and Berry's come on for Townsend. And, um, well, I mean, instantly that, that lifted the crowd, didn't it? Fred went on a sort of mazy run, which didn't lead to anything, but you thought all of a sudden, you know, and then Berry's like, he's like a little pest in there we've mentioned it before in a good way he's like a little pest wherever that ball is he sniffs it out and if he don't get the ball he gets you know the man or something like that and uh and then it leads to the goal doesn't it i mean click has like gone on another one of his runs he's kind of got away from berry but he refuses to let it get away from him plows into a tackle i've still i've watched it on match of the day i've still absolutely no idea how the thing gets through to clark but it does get through to clark who has quite a bit to do actually, but the fact that he has to hit it instantaneously um, kind of makes his mind up for him, and he just coolly puts it in the corner, and uh, well, the noise levels went and <laughs> went up at that point. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe it at that stage because I was sort of resigning myself to something frustrating, and um, it would, I, like I said, I don't, I don't think it would have been a killer. Um, even though in the previous game I, I was thinking you must get something, but then I wasn't counting on Everton getting a result, and I certainly wasn't counting on Brentford coming from two goals down to lead Aston Villa three two at one stage. And so when you're looking at that, uh, you know the whole scenario and the whole picture at that time, I was like, this is not good, not good, not good. So that was that was major relief, really. Um, uh, but it it does always come with this. Uh, caveat of okay goal celebrate where what's the lino doing is this going to be our what's happening because um yeah because it was a, it wasn't a, it was a tackle on it to set it up and who knows what could have happened but um fortunately i have the i i have the benefit of the replays quite quick and i can see what's going on and um i mean that doesn't always give you the outcome you want ask wolves for this weekend but um uh, I was I was confident then that that was that was it and yeah it's, you know twenty twenty minutes and change really to try and get something and they they pushed and pushed and it was what 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 are twenty minutes first Premier League goal for Jordan Clark as well obviously after his brace against Manchester City in the FA Cup earlier in the season and yeah, there's something lovely about that goal wasn't there and not just the fact that it was a Berry tackle that set it up but just the fact that it was Berry was involved in it along with Clark. They're two of the most down-to-earth, nicest geezers you can ever meet. And we'll uh, get Clark's post-match reaction later on in the podcast. And from there, you felt we were going to win the game because for the third Saturday in four, some bizarre substitutions have taken place from the opposition. Um, I mean, they took off... Well, uh, Tavernier, or Tavernier, sorry, he went off with what is now supposedly a hamstring injury. I thought he had cramp, but... Uh, he reckons he's going to be out for three to four weeks, which is unfortunate because they play Brentford in a couple of weeks' time. We could mm. really do with them doing a job on that game. But he went off anyway. Thankfully, Semenya went off at the, um, shortly into the second half as well because even though he wasn't in the game, you could tell we were kind of shitting a brick every time the ball went near him because he just rinsed us down there. Yeah, and That's it. Is that, that's exactly it. But because of that, um, <laughs> it's still very fresh trauma <laughs> of that game at the Vitality. Uh, every time he got the ball, and and he they had more space in the first half, and that's where it was pretty dangerous. He was he was running and running at the town, and that was very very nervy stuff. But um, I thought, like I say, like Issa really managed that quite well and got on top of it in the end. And I think that maybe have contributed to the fact that he went off. Yeah, uh, but when he went off, where the difference was, I mean, we just earlier about. Dominic Solanke's whereabouts on the pitch, but he went from being the centre forward of which he's, what is he, joint third highest scorer in the league to playing off the, on the left wing. Now, if you'd gone over to Rob Edwards and halfway through the second half and said, where would you fancy Dom Solanke playing to give you the best chance of winning? He'd have said, yeah, pop him on the left wing, please, because you weren't going to outrun Issa, was he? Issa's moved to the right by this time because hashi has gone off uh, for Corley Woodrow to come on. And... um 
and lo and behold, that's where he popped up. And uh, they've also made a change uh, in the centre of their defence as well. So Nessie's come on, that was significant. He was uh, he was there when um, the game was moving towards injury time. We were doing everything we could to win this game. There was absolutely no threat coming in the other direction at this point. Uh, it was just whether we could muster up enough sort of will, well, not will, enough energy to get that ball forward and get it into the net. And Sometimes a cross and a finish is just like overlooked f- for its quality, but there was so much I liked about this goal. Alfie fed the ball into Corley Woodrow, but they've got they're two on two down that side, aren't they? But Alfie doesn't stop when he passes the ball to Corley. He goes beyond, and for some god unknown reason, both Bournemouth players go with Alfie, and all of a sudden Corley's got the whole of that main stand side to himself. And then he looks up in the box and the one thing I've seen about these Bournemouth defenders throughout all of these games, they are so tiny for centre-halves. They really are. I mean, Elijah towered over them down there and Morris was certainly no shorter than than them. And um, they've got the two of them. But if you watch the goal back again, just look at Luke Berry's run as Corley Woodrow's about to cross the ball. He completely takes Sinesi away and it leaves... Zabanyi, is that how you pronounce it? And Morris, right in between the goal. And we've already said that the goalie ain't coming for any crosses whatsoever. He's literally rooted to the um, to the white line. And Corley picks out his mate with absolute precision. Morris is like, get the hell off of me to <laughs> Zabanyi. And he opens his foot and he guides... And we, we're used to this volleyed finish from him, aren't we? Everton, Crystal Palace. Sorry, Everton, Aston Villa. Um, and he's done it again and he's put the ball in the bottom corner. And my God... The limbs when that one hit the back of the net. It's, it's rivaling Chongi for uh, against Liverpool. Absolutely brilliant. These boys, they deserved it so so much. And for those players to be involved, Woodrow, who's got so much stick, un un undeserved stick, Morris, who I don't know if you saw the club interview. They said that he was getting some criticism. I've never heard Morris get criticism in the 18 months that he's been here, so I don't know where that came from. But if you if you have criticised him, give your head a wobble because this boy is special. Um, He weren't missing, was he? And what a moment. What a moment. It was one of the moments of the season. If not, when we look back on it, you know, I hope it's up there. Uh, there may be many more to but come. There's so course, much but... technical work that goes into that goal. Just simple runs that you you probably make and, and you're thinking, I don't even know why I'm bothering making this run because you're not going to get the ball. Yeah. Certainly Alfie knows he's not getting the ball back and Barry's only taking a defender out of the equation. But it's it's just poetry in motion when, it, when each move just frees up the man to score. Yeah, beautiful. Um, you have to say it's training around stuff because if anyone got there early enough in their seats, they would have seen them doing that in the yep. warm up. I, I clocked it. Um, I sometimes have to, I film some stuff, so sometimes we have some audio, some visuals to put over the, the interviews that we put in the podcast. And I was filming the um, crossing practice that they were doing, and and Morris did that at least once. Uh, that finish. Um, so it was. It's great when that sort of thing comes off, but. Um, you know the the technique aside, just the the, the importance of it, the, the timing of it, the the deservedness of it, it all, it all came together. And oh man, yeah, I I, I was I was looking, <laughs> didn't know where to look. I was looking over at the, you guys in the crowd. It was going bananas. I was looking at the players who were running over to the corner of the main stand. That was going bananas. Rob Edwards. We got emotional, Rob, didn't we? Running up the line. I was I didn't know where to look. And then I was half in my mind going, is VAR going to get in play because the Bournemouth players were crowding around the ref? And I was thinking, what's going on? There was no flag, of course, but, um, you know, Bournemouth, the Bournemouth man who was supposed to be standing up to Carlton Morris folded like a deck of cards. And who knows? But, um, yeah, um, it was, yeah, it's just, carnage carnage brilliant carnage and we highlighted it didn't we in the preview you've got to put crosses in against this a lot the center halves are small the goalkeepers rooted to the line you're gonna have success from crosses and lo and behold there it is 89th 90th minute straight on morris's foot into the bottom corner and i mean for rob to be as emotional as that you know it was a special moment yeah well it was you know a lot of people were calling it must win and we had that debate in the previous podcast um it, when you think about it with hindsight, yeah, yeah, 
it was. And I asked some of the players as well. And then we said, oh, no, I definitely had to win that one. So the relief to actually do it is is huge. And, and it's it's not fluke. It's just finally the culmination of the the work rate and the effort and the application getting the just desserts and the rewards that they should have got from so many games this season and it hasn't come and we've we've seen late goals like late levelers and stuff like that but this one for to get a win in a must win game um to to kick start this um this this period this all or nothing period it's huge. Um, it's, it's a bloody shame that City's going to get in the way, but I think we can just park that one for now and just um, think think on to the next ones. But yeah, what what a way to win a football match! I mean, let's let's be honest. Normal human beings, they just they just sum up their luck, don't they? And they think it's just not going to happen for us. But these boys aren't normal human beings, and um, but but that's it. That's it. That's a, it's a quite important thing to say, really, because the the boys that won that game in those moves that scored the goals only this season are they used to n- not winning throughout their entire town career. It's just been success and success, and that's in the that's in the brain. I think. I mean, uh, and and also those combinations of players haven't played with her. I, with each other very often this season because they've signed amazing players like Ross Barkley and when he's fit Sam Conga and and the like but when they when they have to be put on and, and play together that is just something that's ingrained in them into how they play where they'll be the movements of each player and it's just a second nature to them muscle memory I call it that you just go in there and and you know what's going to happen and you know doesn't have doesn't matter that it's the Premier League. It could be leaked on League One Championship, whatever. These boys have done it time and time again, and they've come up trumps just when they needed it. I mean, we haven't had much luck. We didn't have much luck yesterday, but finally, Lady Luck shone because somehow there was still time for Alex Scott to curl a shot towards goal. Oh, and heart and mouth every stuff, other yeah. game this season, that's nestled in the bottom corner, either via the original cross or someone's got their head on it to break our hearts. This time it sailed just wide of the post. I was right behind it. I knew it was going wide, but there was a flood of people going yeah. across the front of it. If anyone had got a touch, it was in the back of the net. So finally, Lady Luck upstairs has looked down on us and uh, given us something. And then when the full-time whistle went, the scenes were incredible. You had Ted Mengi down on his knees. I think he was saying a thank you to someone or other. You had Carlton in absolute floods of tears. You had he'd literally every it's player. Gabore had bombed it to the uh, dugouts like they just won the FA Cup final. Uh, they had people collapsing in, in exhaustion. Every was player was celebrating it in their own unique way and you could just tell there just what it means to them. I mean, these boys have fought, most of these boys have come right from the bottom to be Premier League footballers and they are not going to give this away without the mother of all fights and you saw that yesterday and um, yeah, just absolutely incredible what it means to the skipper and I mean, you know, he's absolutely, obviously it's his best mate that he's taken the captain's armband from and he sees a sense of carrying on his sort of legacy, his leadership and everything like that and nine goals for Carlton Morris now this season as well there's only 14 players in the Premier League that have got more and that's uh, that's an achievement in itself if Elijah's not back anytime soon it will be Carlton who's the first one into double figures and um, yeah I'm just delighted for him just delighted for him yeah I mean I, I, I think that that reaction at the end of the game is because he knows that they've been doing their utmost to try and get these results and they're not getting them we feel it too we're like well what more you got to do to you got to you play your hearts out and still you can't get them because x y and z happens and it's the ruthlessness of, of this league and he's experienced hitting a great shot saved by a keeper another one hit a post it's not going in and and then to to get the goals and he's gone he's gone frustrating periods where he hasn't got a goal um, mainly the ones at the start of the season after the first game against Brighton and a long period without scoring. And he's just, when he was playing last season in the Championship, best goal scoring season uh, of his career. I don't. I think he's intelligent enough to know it was going to be hard to do that. If he did, it would be selling him for millions and millions of pounds next season because somebody would want him. Um, 
but he is really, really adapted to this league. He's firstly adapted into a different position when he was playing a role just behind Elijah. And now he's back to the main man again. He's leading the line. He's got the burden of the captainship, you know, standing in for his best mate. Uh, I think that all, all of that comes out and uh, in, in the emotion at the final whistle. It's just a, it's a human emotion of a of a man that you know, loves what he's doing and, and, and wants it so much that um, it, it can get you like that. That's football, isn't it? That's that's the best of football. If you're going through seasons and you're not having highs like that, um, then it, it must be incredibly boring. And he's absolutely knackered as well, isn't he? He's still pressing from the front, but you can tell there's nowhere near the pep in his legs that there was sort of 10 or 15 games ago. He's played in every single Premier League game this season, Carlton Morris, whether it's starting or coming off the bench and uh, it's catching up, but he'll go from the six more games. You know, you absolutely know he will. Let's hear from the uh, standing skipper because uh, after the game, we sent James to the mix zone and he made sure he caught up with the match winner. Carlton, you've scored uh, long-range stunners and plenty of goals in your time, but where does that 90th minute one rank? Oh, right up there. Yeah, right up there, I'll be honest, you know, it's, uh, this is the start now, this is the start, we've got six massive, massive games to come, and uh, we're going to need that energy out of the lads every week. It, it was great to get the equaliser, but it felt like uh, you were pushing and pushing and pushing, it wasn't happening, goalkeeper saving things, you hitting the post, but um, this team doesn't quit, does it? No, it never, never quits, never quits, you know, that's uh, that's part of what got us here, our character and that, and, and you know, we'll show it to the very end of every game, not give up. Yeah. Puts you level on points, of course, with Forest Open, they've got a game in hand, but that's what you needed to be, you need to be in the mix then. 100%, you know, so the performances have been there recently, but ultimately the results haven't been, and, you know, it's time to it's time to man up, to start taking responsibility, and um, and get the results over the line. And you're doing it with... A depleted side. I mean, Reese Burke came back today, so that's a relief because that's not something that's happened very often. Players coming back, but you still got less than half a squad, probably. Yeah, I'll be honest. Like, I've, I've. It's been a tricky one for me whether I've wanted to talk about it or not. But you know, it's getting to the ridiculous point now of like we've got so many injuries. You know, it's hard. It's hard not to. It's hard not to speak about it at this point. But you know, at the end of the day, we've got enough lads to put a good starting eleven together, and um, and the pressure's on us to to stay stay on it and keep doing it every week now. It must be at the stage when players go down, you're thinking not another one, isn't it? Yeah, of course. You know, T, T, Tedham, sorry, Mengi is an absolute warrior. You know, he goes down twice a day. You know, easily could have come off, but, you know, shows his, shows his heart and his passion to continue and play on and when we needed him most, really. So it's huge. Made a nails, that guy, hasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. He's a warrior, man. Uh, but him and um, Issa putting a great <clears throat> performance defensively, um, which I guess gives you a platform to then go and push towards the end. Yeah, exactly. You know, like they've got, a, we have to give ourselves a platform, like you say, we have to give ourselves a foundation where we can go and win a game and that's what they've done today. Yeah, because it's so, so, it's so often been so close, so near yet so far, but that one feels like a turning point almost. Isn't it? For sure, yeah. I, I mean, if we can keep them, if we can keep our opposition to zeros and ones in terms of goals, then we've always got a chance because we've, we've, cons- we've carried a consistent threat this season going forward. And also equally important because you wouldn't have known, but Everton won and Brentford were winning at one point, got paid back to a draw. So it's important to keep in touch with them because you've got them coming up, Everton. It is, yeah. It is, yeah. It's, it's, it's huge, all these games now. And, but as I said, you know, it's the time to stand up and show responsibility. We have to start winning games now, uh, now or never. Yeah, as I said before the interview, absolutely delighted for Carlton. Uh, no one deserves that winning goal more than him. And of course, since James did that interview, Forrest have played their game in hand and they've lost it. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so there's now just four goals between Forrest and Luton Town. And um, well, if rumours are to be believed, we're going to get Everton's point, uh, points deduction result in the coming days too. So they could be a bit closer to us by the next time Luton Town step onto the football pitch. Let's hear from uh, another one of the heroes of the day. And that was the man who set up the winning goal, uh, Carlton's mate, Corley Woodrow. Probably no better way to win football matches than goals in the 90th minute, but you played your part in that and uh, your, your old mate from Barnsley combined. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we needed to win today, obviously, as everyone knows. So, um, so yeah, to get it in the buying moments and, like you say, obviously, it's for me to cross it in. And, um, and for Carlton to be on the end of it is a, is a great moment, yeah, but not just me, obviously. Bez as well today with both the substitutes had parts to play um, in, in the goal here, mate. Um, as as sort of subs have been important all season so obviously yeah really delighted 
I mean, you've scored late goals. I always think back to the Norwich one. Yeah, my boy. Yeah, bro. Uh, I always think back to the Norwich goal and stuff like that. But in, in the in the circumstances you're in, the situation you are in, what what does that goal mean for this survival fight? Yeah, massive. Like we like I just said, we had to win today. So. Um, yeah, it's obviously a, a step in the right direction of where we where we need to be. Obviously, we've got City away then in next next Saturday, um, and then we've got some really good home games coming up, which we're going to need performances like today, really. So, um, so yeah, like I say, it's a, it's a step in the right direction of where we need to to get to. Did you feel today like this was a must win, or uh, just to get something from it, or is it at the stage now where everything's a must win? No, yeah, we had to win today. It was, um, yeah, it was obvious. Um, home game against the. A really good team, obviously, as we know, but um, a really winnable game for us. And um, so, yeah, like, like I said, it was a must win. The manager made it clear, uh, clear that we had to win today and we got the job done. So, it's positive. So that's all the big picture stuff and keeping in the fight for Premier League football survival. It must be nice to get some revenge because of the way it went down at their place a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, um, look, like you say, it was obviously we were flying at their place first half and then we lost the game 4 3. And it was a really sort of uh, low point in our season, uh, to be honest. So yeah, like you say, to not not to get one back because like Bournemouth, Bournemouth ain't done anything wrong to us in in the past. Like they they've been fantastic. That day was obviously when we went back. There was a replay for locks thing. So yeah. I'm not going to sit here and say we got one back on them. We just done our job and we won the game, and and that's all we all we all we need to do really. Does it feel like this will be the kickstart for a, a, a wonderful next month or so? Hopefully, mate. Yeah, um, that's the plan. So. Gives us a, a little lift now, a bit of confidence, but see you later, um, Obviously not overconfident because we've still got some big games coming up and we need to we need to fight hard like we did today to, to get points. Yeah, another huge contribution from Corley Woodrow. Just a month ago, it was his leveller at Palace that earned a point and now he's set up a winner. So three points in injury time on the, off the head and boots of Corley, or via the head and boots of Corley in the last sort of four weeks, really. So he's, he's really having a huge impact in this Premier League season, as indeed they all are if they're fit. And um, long may that continue. Um, Shall we hear from the man who masterminded it all, the gaffer? I think yeah, I think we need to, don't we? I think so, absolutely, yeah. Uh, Rob, he said in the build-up to the game that he put it on the players to win this game. And he, you know, credit where it's due. He openly told everyone that. He put it on them, the players delivered, and uh, here's what he had to say after the game. And um, yeah, lost it for a little bit there. The emotion got to me, and uh, yeah, I, do you know what? Because of the AR as well, now I started thinking, oh no, what have I done? You know, is, it gonna, is, is something gonna? Are they gonna just say no? Um, yeah, it was you know, a big, big statement. Like, yeah, it was a great moment for us there. And I just feel like the two, we've had one and a half games against Bournemouth this year, haven't we? With you know, two really tough games down there for very different reasons. It's nice to get that winning feeling today. Yeah. It's been a tough period and it's going to continue to be that way. So I'm going to try and enjoy it for a short while and then obviously get back to work. But yeah, it feels great. Cause it's hard to win a Premier League game of football, especially for us. Um, you know, that's how it's proven this season. We we knew today was important. We know we've got to find more as well over the last, you know, in the remaining games. So great feeling. Um, we put the pressure on the lads this you know, after Tottenham. Uh, and after Arsenal, and for them to deliver today, it, uh, yeah, I'm really proud of them. Um, thought we deserved it. Thought we played really, really well and showed loads of character and quality after going one nil down as well. Um, they're a really good team, Bournemouth. Brilliant players, and over half a season now they're fifth in the form table. I said this the other day. You know they're they're used to winning, and um, when they go one nil up, they're probably you know expecting to win that game as well. So. We didn't let our heads drop. We bounced back really quickly. I thought the subs made a big impact. And, um, yeah, you know, it's a great feeling it, to get that win because it, um, it was vital today. It's, it's, it's big. It is. It's hard at the moment. It really is with the number of players missing, key players. But that's why I love those lads in there as well. They're giving us everything. We're trying so hard. And you've got Jordan Clark, who's obviously got his first Premier League goal today, who's like so many of our lads who have fought really hard over football, over their footballing journey so far to get here. Yeah, we're very much still in the fight. That is for absolutely. absolute sure. You look at that league table now and it looks a heck of a lot healthier than it did uh, after sort of 65 minutes on um, Saturday afternoon. That's for sure. Rob mentioned a lot about Clicker in that 
post-match. Let's hear from the man who got us back into the game uh, with his first Premier League goal. Here's Jordan Clark. For a result like that, when the goals have come from a combination of you and Beza and, and Corley and, and, uh, yeah. and Colton, that must feel like extra special. About because you've played with each other for a couple of seasons now, it must almost feel like mem- muscle memory to play with them, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is, mate. It is very special, and that's what this club is. You know, it's a special club. Yeah. Obviously, you guys know more than me because you've been you've been around it long, longer than I have. But the four years I've been here, it's just. Can't you enjoy enjoy coming in so much to work every day and just being around the lads, you know, if if we're playing pool or having a laugh or or if we're being serious, it's just we're just such like a tight knit family and um like you said, for Beza to 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 tackle tackle the ball into my path <laughs> and then obviously uh, call his bit of quality, you know, to uh, to find Carlton it it does mean a lot and like I said, we've had brought a lot of quality players in this year. Obviously Ross who's been been excellent, Chio, Chongy, all these players, Ted, and obviously there's obviously more and stuff. But um, like like you said, it's it's special because we've had had such a journey together, especially Bezer, and then obviously Colin Carlton came a little bit later. So um, just shows the power of this club, you know, and giving players a chance, especially from League Two, which are League Ones and the Championships, and obviously it's put it's prevailing in the Premier League. So yeah, it's a special, but it's a special club, isn't it? We said today, don't matter who scored own goals or whatever, as long as we won the game. And uh, yeah, just just buzzing for the win. Yeah, I'm sure I'll reflect later on. You know, when I've calmed down a little bit and the adrenaline stopped pumping through me. So um, obviously a proud moment. You know, as a as a bit selfish proud moment. But um, obviously we knew how massive the game were. You know, he's, uh, we spoke about it all week as a as a team and stuff. Um, just the lads, we had a meeting and things. So uh, a lot of choice words that we said. So it's. Um, mm-hmm. Just nice to see it come off, you know, and we obviously suppose it for the fans as well, because it's been a tough, tough run, you know, and they've stuck with us really well, like they always do. Um, <laughs> so obviously, yeah, just buzzing for the fans as well. Yeah, we was obviously the post Carl and Air shot and were blocked and stuff. So, but um, Beza obviously just affects the game so well, you know, and uh, he's always in there around the box. He's wins headers. He's he's got always going to get a chance and stuff. And him, Fred, and Corley when they came on did really well. Um, and obviously the the block, which was a little bit lucky, could have gone anywhere. Um, and thankfully, it just fell straight to my path, and obviously, just so nice, so nice seat at the back of the net. And you never know with VAR and stuff. Um, I run off to celebrate like a madman, and then I thought, oh dear, this, yeah, no, no, no. please don't, please don't start checking stuff and things. So, um, yeah, just like I said, just buzzing, and obviously the, the lads who came on made such, such an impact, yeah. And then obviously, you know, the, the momentum, especially the Kenny, is uh, is massive. It's a bit weird shooting down mm. towards their fans second half, but. Um, um, I think it sort of froze us a little bit, especially yeah. first half kicking yeah. to our fans. Um, but like I said, it's just what a day, you know, and we know how important it is today. And especially with, with a tough game next week. Um, uh, obviously, we knew we had to win today. So much emotion. Um, and like I said, just buzzing for Corley as well because it was a hell of a ball, you know, and so much he's got so much quality and uh, mm. to put it in the mix like that. And obviously, the big man does what he does best. You give him the service like that, he's 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 not gonna miss. So yeah, just really happy and uh, just buzzing for everyone involved, you know. It's, it's, it's a tough season at the minute, you know, especially with the uh, especially the injuries and stuff. Honestly, I've never seen anything like it and to uh, to do what we're doing. It's, it's just phenomenal and uh, looking so proud of the squad. As we all are, Clicker, as we all are. Uh, man who got us into the Premier League with his goal at Wembley, it's only fitting he scores in the Premier League. That's now the top five divisions in English football that Jordan Clark scored in. And I mean, we always love seeing Jordan Clark do well because he's just such a good guy. I've interviewed him plenty of times. You've interviewed him even more times. He always gives great time to us, to everyone. Down to earth fella and um, typical Luton, down to earth blokes doing top quality things. Yeah, I've got a lot of time for um, most of the squad, to be honest, but you know, Jordan as well, because he's, he's been down in the conference and he knows what it's all about and he's worked so hard and to, to get up and, you know, Luton, Luton took him at a time when he was posting some of the best stats in Europe for a winger and he was playing for Accrington Stanley and probably because the fact he was playing for Accrington Stanley, no one else looked at him um, and Luton did. He's been a great servant for this club and he's still doing the business. I had a really good chat with him um, after that game. That's just a snippet that you heard there. It was about 10 minutes. Um, just just 
just a proper like a normal bloke. He's playing in the Premier League. He's just scored a prem, first ever Premier League goal. And whatever preconceptions people have about footballers, hardly any of them apply to um, Luton players. No, they don't. And they certainly don't apply to Jordan Clark. Uh, I interviewed him in the uh, town hall after the parade after Wembley and uh, you could see that it was he's struggling to take it all in and he was, you know, trying to do it justice and make sense of it all. But he was still probably running on adrenaline and everything else mm-hmm. from scoring the goal at, at Wembley and things, as I'm sure he was when uh, when you spoke to him. Yeah, great to uh, great to have him back isn't it? Because he's just so naturally athletic in the centre of the park. And even when things ain't going for him, like they didn't go for him in that first half, as Rob alluded to, he doesn't shy away, go and get the ball and he'll go and do Jordan Clark things. And even if you think back to Wednesday night, it was him who was leading the way through the lines against Arsenal, you know, and you look what Arsenal did to Brighton yesterday. It kind of shows you exactly where it all is. And um, he's not only, doing that as a player that has played for Hyde in the in the conference um he's doing that as a player that used to be a winger and he's now a central midfielder uh, and a creative one so creative in fact that they didn't have anyone to replace him with when he was not having the best of time in the first half so he just played through that and then he got his rewards it's you know his his and so many i mean he's Barry got the honour first of being the first Luton player to score in all five divisions, but now um, Jordan Clark is up there with him. They're, they're the two players. And if if Pelly gets one as well this season, um, maybe on his 400th appearance, which would be the next time he plays, then um, it'd be a select band of, of players that are just so deserving of all these accolades because of everything that they've done for this club. Indeed so, yep. So very Luton, uh, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, You've picked out Issa Kabore for his defensive efforts in that first half, well, first hour in particular. We mentioned it, didn't we, after the Arsenal game? He has been really, really good since um, that own goal against, uh, sorry, that um, switching off against Aston Villa, apart from the own goal against Tottenham. He's going to be a big miss on Saturday. Yeah, he is, because he's not allowed to play uh, for his parent club. But um... Come on, Pep. <laughs> Help us out. We promise you can switch off at the back stick so that you beat us by one, but let him play. Come on. <laughs> Come on, Pep. Yeah, it, it it's, I mean, I mean, probably going to be no more depleted though, because obviously Reese Burke came back and we haven't had too many times this season or certainly in the last two months where an injured player has come back and, and, and played so well for starters, but, um, uh, and then certainly in Reese Burt's career at Luton has been so unfortunately blighted by injury that when he does get them, he's out for months, isn't he? Or weeks and months. Uh, so for it just to be well, less than two weeks or something like that, um, is, is great for him and for him to play so well was wonderful. Um, and yeah, but as far as Issa Kabore is concerned, I think <clears throat> his performances were saying this to me anyway. They were, they were really good top class performances. I don't know. Um, I don't know how he shanked it into the goal at Tottenham. I don't know uh, how he went to sleep against Villa, of course. But his reaction, but his performance for starters of was so pivotal in stopping the threats that Bournemouth had. But his reaction afterwards, I've got a very shaky video. I might put it on, but it might give you a headache if if I put it on here. That it it he just runs to the the dugout like. He's not even a Luton Town player. No, he gets the Man City player absolutely loves it, and he's like um, running to the dugout like he, like I say, like he'd won the FA Cup. It was that sort of reaction. And when you have lone players that are doing that, you know that they buy into it, and they're not just there to get the experience or get the the the, the minutes under the, uh, their belt. I mean, he's probably got a long way. And there's no disrespect to him; he's probably got a long way for him to get into the city side, isn't he? So. You know whether he has a Luton Town career beyond this is no nobody knows. But what he's doing right now, here and now, for for this club is is great. It really is, yeah. Uh, I should say I'm jesting. I know it's not in the rules that he's allowed to play, and it's nothing to do with Pep mm-hmm. and everything else. Well aware of that, he will miss Saturday's game, and he'll be a big miss. We need to give Reese Burke some serious, serious kudos because I'm led to believe he didn't train. Or if he did train, he trained very minimally 
in the lead up to that game. Obviously, he went off at half time against Tottenham. Uh, he had James Madison in one pocket that afternoon. Still space for Dominic Solanke in the other pocket uh, here, but he was excellent to play 90 minutes, having gone off just seven days earlier. Like you say, it's not what we're accustomed to seeing with Reese Burke, but every single time that ball went into Solanke, he would step in front of him or he would wrestle or be physical with him and he would get the ball off of him or if he didn't get the ball off of him Solanke had to move it on straight away and more often than not he was moving it backwards rather than forwards he just took Solanke who as I said earlier third fourth leading scorer whatever he is um in the country he just took him right out of the game he was not a factor at all and to do that we know his injury record we know that you know maybe he doesn't trust his body completely because of all of the injuries but to forget all of that and put that performance in no chapeau to you uh full full credit reese yeah it was a huge performance because solanke just gets usually gets a customary goal against luton you know regardless of how well he's played i mean i know you've said before and do a lot else other than score but i mean not bad to to do that's what he's there for scoring that many goals but it was just a non-factor in that game and uh, yeah, Reese Burke, huge credit to that. I mean, we, we we've talked about him so many times, but I don't think he gets the recognition because he doesn't get the long runs in in the side because of the injuries that he's having. So, if he was robust, yeah. he would be a defender at this level of a very much higher club than Luton Town. He's that good. He's absolutely brilliant. If ever we can find the plan to get the boy fit to do a thirty-eight game season, Jesus, him and Ted Mengi in the centre of defence, watch out. <laughs> I got sent this morning uh, the lyrics to a Reese Burke song that uh, a mate of mine had made up. Hello, Danny. Um, to the tune of 1998 Britpop Has Beans the Dandies. If you know the song, um, kudos to you. But um, that's, and he wrote out the full lyrics. They were very good. I've, I'm no singer, so I'm going to give them to you. But listen to that song and uh, maybe if you want the lyrics, I'll, I'll ask him if I can send you. But that's the sort of love that, that Reese Burke deserves yeah indeed we've always loved him on this podcast haven't we we've appreciated the um strong suits strong assets that he's got and uh yeah long may that continue i just want to finish this podcast off though with the skipper because you know it's he's not just taken over from anyone he's taken over from his best mate as as the captain he's shouldering the responsibility on the pitch he's he is clearly absolutely shattered He's, but he will not lie down. He will not take no for an answer. He will not give in. And even though everything's against him, and again, he spoke about that on parts of the um, interview that you did with him that we've not included here, just because we don't want to make a big thing of excuses. Sound is like excuses talking about all of these injuries, don't we? And we will keep that away from it. But, you know, he's refusing to let all of the sort of things that could creep in. He's refusing to let it creep in and be an excuse. And yeah, fair play to him. Fair play to him. And if he's got, I don't know, three or four more goals in him between now and the end of the season, they could be the three or four more goals that keep Luton Town in the Premier League. Yeah, well, yeah, he's been a great player since he's come. Obviously, last season was sensational. Um, And for him to come in and have to adapt to the Premier League in two or three different ways that he has is is outstanding. And... um, you know, he's he's. I think he was captain material in in the sense that he's one of the senior players a, anyway. But to have to go into that role um, as well is is difficult, man. I don't I don't think people quite appreciate it, particularly in the way that he's had to assume that armband, which he wouldn't have wanted, and nobody would um, with his with his mate getting um, suffering a cardiac arrest. Of course, it's in front of him exactly for the second time. Uh, this in a year um it's, it's well no sorry it wasn't the first time it wasn't a cardiac arrest let's get that quite right it was a atrial fibr- fibrillation but still collapsed twice on the pitch in front of him um yeah it's difficult man and um yeah to 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 lead the line in the premier league pretty much on his own at the moment and the way he is I know the way that Luton play, he has support and that's why the goals are coming so much. Uh, other than Arsenal, um, you know, 20 games that they've scored a goal and they're up there 
I think behind Newcastle for the most amount of goals consecutively scored in the Premier League for a newly promoted team. And that's phenomenal, really. And it's just the fact that at the other end, they found it so ruthless and difficult to keep them out. As showed yesterday against Bournemouth, when they didn't really create too much other than long range shots. Um, and still got a goal. It, it's di very difficult. But I think probably also it's difficult to keep goals out in the Premier League across the board. There's only really Arsenal that are being particularly stubborn at the moment, I think, isn't it? Even everyone's everyone's conceding goals here and there. So, um, yeah, so then Luton have got to go up, and, up the other end and, and score him. And he's, he's creating them, he's scoring them, he's playing a major role in some of these important points and in victories that Luton have got. And... I'm so pleased for him as well because I think that people were questioning him at the beginning of the season where he could, whether he could cut it as a uh, as a Premier League striker. Uh, I don't think us we weren't, but it's, it was just because of the, the amount of times he hadn't scored. But then he wasn't getting the chances to score, and we have spoken about this before. He, it, he wasn't having the opportunities, not in the way that Elijah was when he came back and did so well, and suddenly they figured that out and how to create service and. You've got to look at the bigger picture with these sorts of things, but um, the bigger picture with Carlton Morris is that I think he he recognises that he's worked so hard over his career to get to this stage where he can call himself a Premier League striker, and he is now. Uh, you know, he's being talked about on Match of the Day yesterday. You know, immediately they pick the players out that score the goals and talk about them, so he probably hasn't got the plaudits that he probably deserved from that particular programme, but that's just the way that that format works. But he did um, this weekend. Um, and rightly so. So um, it, it's it's great for him to to be able to say that he's a Premier League striker, but he doesn't want to say it was just a one season uh, adventure, really. So and that's the same for all of them. But it, it it comes from the front, and when you hear that he was the man leading the call for a player meeting on the Thursday to, to talk about how important this was, and it's 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 just the leadership qualities you want just when you need them. Yeah, I just loved the fact that these boys recognised how big it was and that they turned up and delivered and got the job done. I mean, you know, as I've said before, lesser men could wilt under what we face this season, but they're not going to. Uh, and actually, Carlton, he's moulded himself into a seriously, seriously good player. He's even improved from the start of the season. His hold-up play now is different class. He can hold a defender off. His touch is really, really good. He often brings Barkley into the game. If you think back to the winning goal, I didn't mention this earlier in the podcast, but it's him chesting the ball down and laying it off to Alfie Doughty that launches that move. But he ain't staying in the halfway line, even though he's shattered after 90 minutes of graft. He's getting his ass in that box and there's his reward uh, when he puts the winning goal away. And uh, yeah, kudos to you, Carlton. Uh, he, you're might be a stand-in skipper because Tom's the club captain, but you're very much worthy of being a captain of Luton Town. That absolutely. is absolutely sure. That's almost it for this episode of the podcast. But if you were at Kenworth Road uh, yesterday, you before the kickoff, you will have paid your respects to four former Hatters, uh, Ron Bainham goalkeeper, England international goalkeeper who made over 400 appearances for the club and obviously of course was part of the FA Cup uh, final side in 1959. Jimmy Husband, Billy Kellock and Mick Collins were all paid tribute to. Uh, they were all of an era way before myself and James uh, became followers of this club but unfortunately news came to us just before we started recording this podcast this evening that former manager Joe Kinnear has passed away now he was very much someone who was part of the club at the time that me and James were following it he was the manager of that wonderful League 2 side in 2001-2002 he was also at the helm that magical magical night at Vicarage Road in September 2002 where Matthew Spring let fly from 40 yards and if you were there you'll never forget it he was a charismatic man he was a popular man amongst Luton fans he really was obviously helped by the fact that Big Mick was his assistant as well but we got right behind the man that was affectionately known as Big Fat Joe and um, yeah he was one of the uh, one of the greater managers that we've had at a the time that that we needed a good manager really and of course it was his sacking that kind of led to the sort of caution with regards to John Gurney which was 
part of why the trust is now in existence. So there's a link between the Supporters Trust and Joe Kinnear. Our, fr our thoughts go out to the friends and family of everyone I've just named there, but in particular, Joe Kinnear, who was just a charismatic, uh, legendary manager of this football club. Yeah, um, he was. Um, he was uh, slightly before my time in a professional sense, but obviously very well aware of him for that promotion winning season and uh you know since we got the news which is terribly sad we've had lots of funny messages going on about which is the, the best tribute to to people that people like joe and i just i really chuckled at one that got sent over in the group chat today because obviously he managed nottingham forest as well and um, he said um the problem with nottingham forest is you can't do as much as fart in the city ground without someone sticking their head around the door to tell you how they'd won the european cup and that's uh, that's very much what joe was like that was joe yeah you always had a line didn't he was it coca-cola sorry champagne ideas on coca-cola budgets and things like that wasn't it and that uh, was about the gurney and his lot wasn't it yeah and uh you know he's plenty of other things about fans being donuts and affectionate or not affectionate <laughs> thoughts of plymouth and things like that yeah uh he was the manager of a of a really good time in our history and i know obviously there was a lot of fallout uh, in the years that followed but anyone who followed the town in that league two promotion winning season saw some great football some brilliant matches and of course he masterminded that night down at vicarage road so he'll be sadly sadly missed by all at kenilworth road and our thoughts and best wishes go out to his friends and family that is it for this episode of the podcast thanks to correct score winning guru James, come on for your top of the league. I mean, if anything, I mean, that's the story of the weekend, isn't it? No, <laughs> that's absolutely not the score. But I've got to be honest, I'm mighty bloody glad you was right for um, once in your life. I'm mighty glad that you have was... you said that I was so right that I predicted Bournemouth would score first. I left the door open for you to do that, <laughs> and you hadn't until then. So well done on getting that in as well you did call it absolutely spot on even if if i'd rung you up after an hour you'd have thought you'd been talking bullshit <laughs> yeah I, well i can blame andrew at the club for reminding me of that i might have forgotten <laughs> i'll have words with him at the training day uh, on monday um yeah thanks for your thoughts thanks for you for watching or listening and once again so many people came up to me yesterday and told us how you're enjoying the podcast uh we really appreciate your support particularly this week there have been so many podcasts i feel like this is my second home this set and i'm sure james does too i'm very very tired and uh and more than more to the point we, every we go and get a drink down at the high town club and now they're like the usual and so which has good connotations as well but we're basically here all the bloody time we haven't we? quite got them to deliver it to the studio yet have we but <laughs> yeah. i'm sure that will come between now and the end of the season thanks to everyone who's been subscribing we should have details of our giveaway within the next week or so so we will get that sorted out i'm just waiting for an event to be finalized and we'll get that show on the road because we've promised you that for far too long We've also got a special bonus podcast with Thomas Kaminsky that we were going to put out last week, but there were too many podcasts, so we'll, uh, we'll put it out this week. Yeah, we kind of planned that just so badly in light, <laughs> in light of the fixtures that came over the last week, but it is not time sensitive. It is still perfectly relevant, and I hope you enjoy it when that comes out. Thanks to the Hightown Club for staging our studio, as always, to Sean Grant and the Wolf Gang for our intro music, and to Ed Smith Creative for all the designs that you see on set. Until next time, which is a preview of just a small clash with Manchester City, we are bang in this. Come on, you atters. Can you believe it? We are yes! I love this town. I love this town. I love this, this town. You know what I love about this town? is actually you. Everyone in it has got this massive soul. We're looting people. And that's what we care about.